This is where Sam wants to lay. His back on my back. That's fine. That's fine with me. Hi guys, it's Vanessa. I'm back with another wrap-up video. It was cold, but now I'm hot. This one's gonna contain lots of graphic novels and memoirs, which is what I've been reading pretty much exclusively in December. And then some other things that I read that were still nonfiction November-ish. I first wanted to talk about Carrie Fisher's Wishful Drinking, which I listened to on audiobook. It was really short on audiobook, and I would recommend it for that because you get to know Carrie Fisher, her personality really well. I thought through that audiobook that she narrated herself, um, I could kind of get her humor. I and mean, as a person who didn't really grow up with the Star Wars movies and didn't really know that much about Carrie Fisher until like she came back to the new movies that they're making and then she passed away that I started to kind of want to learn more about her. I didn't feel like I got to know everything about her in this. I think it was just funny stories and her using her sarcasm to talk about difficult issues in her life. But I did enjoy this for what it was. I also wanted to talk about my companion reading of Laurie Haas Anderson's Speak, which I reread for the first time in like five years and I listened to it for the first time on audiobook. I really, really enjoyed the audiobook experience. The narrator was great at conveying the tone of Melinda, which was something that I had completely forgotten about, just how sardonic she is in her thoughts, and I didn't really remember any of that. And I'm still unsure about the ending, which is something that was in my original review for this book on Goodreads from years and years ago, and I still kind of feel the same way today. But the reason why I really did want to reread this was partly because Deboki at Okidoki Boki read it and she kind of compared this to the Kavanaugh hearing and I thought that was a really interesting reason to analyze this book. So that's part of the reason why I reread it but then I also reread it so that then I could read the new graphic novel of Speak that came out this year. All the illustrations are by Emily Carroll who I enjoy her art style. It's very gothic and kind of dark and I thought that it suited Melinda's character and like the story really well. I was kind of amazed and it's probably because of the size of this graphic novel compared to the book how much they were able to keep from the original text in here. It felt like I was rereading the original book. The original book is kind of sparse so I kind of get that so I really enjoyed this. I think I had a harder time reading through quickly because uh, it was so similar to the original book. So I think they're pretty, in my mind, synonymous with each other at this point. The only real difference is that this one mentions Instagram, <laughs> so it kind of fits the time period a little bit better. But I would recommend both of those if you haven't read Speak. It's a YA classic that you should read. Next, let's talk about all these graphic um, novels. I don't remember which one I read first, but I'll just kind of go through sort of an order. I read Sabrina, which was in a lot of years and best of lists for different magazines and, and newspapers and I was kind of like, hmm, interesting. All I really went in knowing was that this had to do with our political moment. Yes, it does have to do with our moment. It uses this situation, this plot point of a missing person, Sabrina, and then her boyfriend of the time moves in with his high school friend who he hasn't seen in a long time. And it's him kind of like spiraling out of control in his mind because Sabrina is missing and nobody knows what happened. It kind of becomes one of those social media events where everybody has an opinion and also where everybody thinks that they're the best investigator. And all these people believe that they start uncovering these conspiracy theories about what's really happening. Just trolls and think about like tragedy porn and like people inserting themselves into these stories where bad things are happening. So I really enjoyed those parts of it just because it kind of like showed the absurdity of the way we live right now and kind of like the social media bubbles that we live in. I think one downside to this was how dense it was in some pages and I think there was a point that the illustrator was trying to make about you know like all this information is just like ooh, compounding in your head and it's just non-stop. It was just a lot of text and sometimes it was very very tiny and hard to read. The illustrations I think he's trying to go for this like really like simple boring kind of style which is trying to show you that 
we're all in this kind of vacuum and we're like nobodies and we're like cogs. I don't really know, like it didn't really impress me. I think it fit the story, but I don't know if it, it didn't really wow me. I think what's really interesting here is how it takes these things that we've been living in for the past, say, like three or so years, four years, distills them in this plot in a way that you're like, mm, I see that reference. Mm, I understand where that's coming from. In a way that's never like in your face, but it's still kind of making you think about the life you've been living for the last four years. So I would recommend Sabrina. I thought it was an interesting graphic novel. It would definitely start some conversations for sure. I also read Louisa Now and Then. This is originally written by um, Carol Maurel, and I believe it's French. I'm not 100% sure, but it was adapted by Mariko Tamaki, and so she created her own art for this story. And it's a time-traveling, coming-of-age story where our main protagonist goes to the future and sees who she becomes later on in life, and they meet, and then it's them talking to each other about how their life was in the past and how their life is now, and kind of, you know, understanding how our dreams sometimes just die as we get older. Just how things pan out in a way that you don't really expect. The older Louisa feels this way about the younger Louisa, and the younger Louisa feels this way about the older Louisa. I thought that it was really lighthearted, and I thought that it was a good coming-of-age story. I don't think like anything amazing or life-changing happened here, but if you're looking for something light, and especially if you're looking for something with a queer protagonist in a graphic novel, I would definitely recommend this. And I did really enjoy the art just because I love Mariko Tamaki so much. I wanted to talk about Spill Zone, The Broken Vow next, which was a really disappointing read. Maybe my problem was that I didn't read the first one again after I had read it a year and a half ago. So it's been a year and a half since the last one was published, and this is the conclusion to this duology. It just felt like a lot of jumbled mess. Things did not make sense to me when I was reading this. I was really confused about what was going on, who all these different bad guys were, what we were trying to follow, who this new character is, who I don't really understand. Stuff having to do with the creepy doll from the first book. I didn't get pretty much any of it. There's like a final action scene that was also like super jumbled. It was like three pages long and all of a sudden everything is fixed. I feel like we could have just devoted a little bit more time, spent a little bit more time developing this and creating something that made sense. I really enjoy the coloring in this graphic novel series, but I, I am not here for this story. I think it could be really cool, but I just don't think it's executed correctly. Finally, I finished reading The Cadaver King and the Country Dentist. This was a nonfiction November pick that I really had a hard time reading because the text is so tiny in this book and like so stuck together, like the paragraphs are so long and it never inspired me to pick it up. So I put it on hold, it took me a long time to get to the top of the list and then I finally did. I listened to it in like three days or two days really quickly, finished it up because audiobooks have saved me like that this year. This was very interesting. It is exactly the kind of thing that I like to read having to do with the criminal justice system and things that were incorrectly done, incompetence in the criminal justice system and kind of like how it all has unraveled on these people. What's really fascinating about this story, I think, is that still to this day, the state of Mississippi hasn't really amended the problems that were created by these two expert witnesses who are the cadaver king and the country dentist. The first one was a guy who did hundreds of autopsies a year, which was not recommended. Several hundred autopsies a year, by the way. And the second guy was like a jack of all trades who was mostly a bite mark expert. He somehow was able to tell how victims were bitten right before they were they died and he could tell you who bit them. And miraculously, it always seemed to be the defendant that the prosecution was trying to convict. They were really charming towards a jury and judges just let all of this testimony in. It convicted a lot of people. A lot of them have been exonerated thanks to DNA evidence that has proven that they weren't even there when all of these things happened. And we follow lots of different cases, which kind of got confusing sometimes. I think the first third of the book is a lot more smart and concise because we're just following two cases. I think after that it pulls back the curtains completely and shows you like all of the situations and cases where these two men were involved and the prosecution just like turned a blind eye to the fact that they were using testimony that wasn't actually correct science and lots of juries who didn't know any better thought they knew what they were talking about and voted to convict. There's lots of like little nuggets and tangents as well. If you're interested in learning about like where corners came from, you should read this. A lot of stuff about the Innocence Project involved in here as well as like 
the science that these people were doing and like what's actually what should actually be done in a normal investigation. But I did think that I learned a lot from this and I was happy that I finally finished it. The last thing that I have to talk to you about is The Bride Was a Boy. And this is a manga that goes through our main character, Chi, who is a real person, describing her transition from being a boy to being a woman and how that all works in Japan. Like the things that you have to do to physically change and then what you have to do like to change your gender on a form to make you legally a woman. Also a love story between her and her fiance turned husband, all the planning that needs to happen, and just a happy moment of them starting their life together. This was a lot more informative than I expected it to be. I thought it was going to be a little bit more personality focused or like um, deep dark thoughts focused and instead it, it felt like um, a lesson which I did learn a lot from and I'm, I'm glad that it was there but like it starts and ends the chapters with lots of information and sometimes it was repetitive because it would be talked about in that chapter that was next. After a while I didn't feel as compelled to pick this up just because I felt like the kind of emotional connection to a person wasn't there. It kind of depends on what you're trying to get out of graphic works that have to do with real life. In this one I feel like I didn't really learn that much about our artist and, and writer. I felt like I just learned more about the process that she went through. Yeah, but still interesting and I think still something that you should pick up if you're trying to read more manga or if you're trying to learn more about transgender folks. Let's talk really quickly about what I'm currently reading. I am... A little bit more than halfway through Belonging, A German Reckons with History and Home. This is a graphic memoir, kind of like art book really, having to do with Nora Krug, who is the writer and illustrator, going back through lots of archives and files and family histories to understand her family's involvement um, with the Nazis. And if they were involved, she kind of doesn't know yet. I haven't really gotten an answer yet, but she feels really guilty about it. So it's it's fascinating to kind of hear those really serious dark thoughts of a person having to kind of feel this internal pain about like who her family was and like what her own blood has done. So far I'm interested in this. I think it was a lot more interesting in the first, I don't know, like 50 or so pages and now it's kind of slowed down. We haven't really gotten any answers and she's not really thinking about her identity anymore. She's kind of just like telling you things that were happening in history but I'm hoping that as I finish this we'll finally get kind of like the answers of her family's like actual involvement or non-involvement in this and how she really thinks about all that after learning about it. Those are all the things that I've read and I'm currently reading. I hope that you enjoyed this video. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you in my next one. Bye bye.